Well, good morning, First Baptist Pekin. It's a joy. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Schaefer, and uh, I get the pleasure of preaching to you today um, on loan from Bethany Baptist over in uh, Peoria, right outside Peoria. Um, I am the children and family pastor there at, at Bethany. I've had the privilege of being there for four years now. Um, I have a beautiful wife named Lindsay and a little baby girl named Ava of uh, a couple months. So this is our first Mother's Day with, that my wife and I are going to celebrate with, for her. Um, and so I'm thankful to, to be with you today. Um, also, just wanted to say thank you also. I know this doesn't, doesn't impact me directly, um, but for Pastor Vern's sabbatical, I think it's an amazing thing that you all have said that you want to give him that time to rest, recharge, uh, be thinking about how to lead you um, into the future. So uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Also, happy Mother's Day. Uh, thankful for all of our moms here. And I know Mother's Day is a time of sweet rejoicing and a time that families can gather together. And it's also a reminder of the hope of heaven as uh, there's many of us here whose moms are either no longer with us or those of you who desired to become moms and the Lord did not deem that um, for your life. Um, wherever you find yourself today in relation both to Mother's Day and also just to your Christian walk, uh, I want to bring to you two Psalms, Psalm 42 and 43 today. And if you're taking notes, the title of this message is When God Feels Distant. When God Feels Distant, Soul Talk for the Spiritually Downcast. Uh, so I'm going to read Psalm 42 and 43 in its entirety, and then we'll pray, and then we'll look at what God has to teach us from his word. Let's go before the Lord in worship through the reading of his word, Psalm 42, verse 1. To the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? 
And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Father, we ask for your help today. I pray, Lord, that you will give us ears to hear, hearts softened, to obey your word, to see the beauty of who you are through this psalm, to see the glory of Christ in it. For your glory and for our good, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin this quote, with, this sermon with a quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a famous preacher back in the 20th century in England. He preached a sermon on this, these two psalms, and here's one of the things that he said. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, the day before, and then the days ahead. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42 and 43 was this. Instead of allowing himself to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Point being, we can't trust what our own heart tells us. We can't trust how our own heart feels. We can't trust the way that we perceive the world is right and accurate and true. We must rather trust in what God says about us about ourselves, about himself, that we can find true hope when our soul needs help. And Psalm 42 and 43 show us the way. When God feels distant, what do we do? Well, Psalm 42 and 43, they're meant to be read together. They're not meant to be separated because there's the common refrain, and I'm sure you heard it three times, why are you cast down, O my soul? So this is the same author, same theme, same application. And so let's look verse by verse at what this psalm has to tell us. At the beginning of the psalm, before it even starts, it says, to the choir master of the sons of Korah. You might be thinking to yourself, so what? Who cares? Well, the sons of Korah, they had an important role in the life of Israel, and they were meant to lead the people to God in song. They were Israel's worship leaders. They were the gatekeepers. They were the ones from the tribe of Levi. And this was their specific role. And so we must read these Psalms in light of that. And also in light of the fact that to be near the temple, therefore meant you were near God. And to be far from the temple meant that you were far from God. And gathering for worship at the temple was an immense privilege. It's like when the psalmist said in Psalm 84, better is one day in your courts than what? A thousand elsewhere. And so the sons of Korah write this psalm down to instruct us, and they write it for us to see through the lens of an individual priest who is now far from God, far from Israel, far from the temple. And we'll see what this priest, what this psalmist does when he's far from God. The question is, why is he not where he should be? That's the question you should be asking when we come to this passage. Now, we don't know the specific reason for that. It could have been because he was ceremonially unclean and defiled, could have been he was making a trip away and outside of the land of Israel, got delayed, maybe attacked, maybe taken prisoner. Maybe the nation was conquered through national exile and he was one of the prizes for one of the nations. Maybe he was personally kidnapped and taken far off. We don't know for sure, but we do know that he's far from the temple and therefore to be far from God. And he has little chance of going back at least humanly speaking. So what he does there is talk truth to himself and instructs his own soul what God says is true. Let's look at verse one. In verse one through five, we're gonna see first the psalmist's longing. What is he longing for? 
He's longing for a return to God's presence. Return to God's presence. So he says and describes himself as a deer panting for flowing streams. He says, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I went to Israel in 2016, had the privilege of going there for two and a half weeks, and I was shocked at one part of the landscape that I think the psalmist has in mind here. When you go from Jerusalem, from this place of where there's springs that come forth from the ground, where there's the Judean hill country, where there's all kinds of life and lush greenery, just a couple miles east, it turns immediately into a barren wasteland. On the way down to Jericho, through the red, to, down to the Dead Sea, you get there and it looks like a completely different place. You don't see cornfield after cornfield like you do here. It is such a unique difference between what you see in Jerusalem versus what you see just a few miles east. I remember going there and we had the AC of a charter bus and um, bottled water at every gas station that was there, but I'm just imagining as I'm going down there, the psalmist seeing himself go and leave the presence of God into death, into deserted barrenness. And the psalmist uses this imagery that perfectly describes him being far from the temple. He's dry, he's thirsty, he's weary. And what he wants to do is he wants to ask God the question. Look at the end of verse 2. He says, when shall I come and appear before God? Or rather, when shall I come and see the face of God? In Numbers chapter 6, when Aaron blessed the people, he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. He said, the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance or face upon you and give you peace. To live in God's presence meant to live in light of his glory and for the presence of God to see the people and for the people to see God. At least see where his glory was. At least worship at the temple. And I want you to notice something that's really interesting. The psalmist is not wanting to come back into the land because it's where he's comfortable. He doesn't want to come back because that's where his family is. He doesn't want to come back because it's where his home is, where, where he grew up. It's not where he speaks the native language. He wants to come back to the promised land. Why? Because that's where God is. That's what matters to him. And I want to ask you, can the same be said of you today, where you long for God's presence where you long for communion with him in prayer, where you long to be with his saints here at the the church and say, I need time with the Lord. I need time in his word. I need to be with his saints. I need to worship with God's people. I'm thirsty. The psalmist wants God more than he wants the things that God gives. And so look at what he says in verse three. It says, my tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? In other words, is God really for me? Why would God leave me in exile? Is God not strong enough than this other nation's gods? Did God not delight in me? Did I not serve him like I was supposed to? Well, look at verse 4. The psalmist remembers where he was before. He says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go or cross over with the throng and lead them in procession to the house or temple of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. When he says, I would go, it literally means I would cross over. And you're meant to read that and remember the ways that God delivered his people before when God crossed over. Like in Exodus chapter 12, when God passed over or crossed over the blood on the doorpost when he was going through Israel or going through Egypt, when he passed through the waters of the Dead Sea with his people to deliver them and they crossed over. Or maybe in Joshua 3, when the people crossed over the Jordan River to go into the promised land, 
right here using this word, the psalmist is longing for God to do the exact same thing that he did before for him. He wants God to do the same deliverance. The question is, is God going to answer his prayer? Is God going to do for this priest, this one man, like he did so many times before for the people? That's what he's hoping for. So I want you to see in verse 5 what he does now. He talks to himself. He speaks to himself, and he does it in this way. This is his method. First, he says, why are you cast down? He questions his current feelings. His feelings don't rule him. His feelings are not the indication of what's really true. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil or troubled within me? Next, he says, hope in God. He actually commands his soul and instructs his soul who he must place his hope in. Not in Israel to come and rescue him. Not in maybe him getting an opportunity to escape. He says, hope in God. Then he says, for I shall again praise him. Where he is right now is not where he will always be. And he reminds himself that his current situation, this isn't the end. I'm going to again praise him. I know it. And then he says, my salvation and my God. God is going to be faithful to him. And he reminds himself of that. And he chooses to remember God in this way because that's how God revealed himself. Is there a part of you that feels any of what the psalmist felt today? Of where you look at these verses and you say, my soul thirsts for God. My tears have been my food night and day. Why is my soul cast down? Why am I troubled? In those times of where you feel the way the psalmist felt, what did you turn to comfort yourself with? What did you tell yourself? Did you talk to yourself? How did you talk to yourself? What did you put your hope in? For the psalmist, he was discouraged and depressed He was far from God's presence. But for you, is this the source of your longing, your pleading, your thirsting? For some of you, no doubt, when you read this psalm, you feel this pull to be nearer to God. You feel the desire to be close to him. You feel the the presence of God with you and you remind yourself of those promises And maybe for others of you, that pull to be near God's presence often comes with the choice to choose something that's further and different and less than him. The psalmist gives us a way of escape that when we may not sin, when we feel despair. It's always better to take hope in the Lord and wait on him. It's always better to look into the mirror and choose to speak truth to ourselves regardless how we feel or what we think we deserve. Pastor Jim Hamilton down in Louisville, Kentucky, I love what he says so far about this psalm. Look at it with me. The psalmist seems to have worked to a resolution in 42.5, but his soul has not risen from its sunken state. This is the way life works. And the fact that the psalmist is dealing with it too is tremendously encouraging. Arriving at the right answer, knowing theological truth, as the psalmist obviously does, has neither altered his physical circumstances nor lifted him from the emotional low. So what does he do? He keeps right on praying. He persists. He still does not resort to idolatry or sinful sources of comfort, and he still refuses to join the adversaries who have rejected the Lord. And so what does the psalmist comfort himself with rather than despair into sin? Well, he reminds himself of God's character. This is point number two through verses six through 11. We're gonna see the psalmist wrestle with God's character. And in that, he's gonna remind himself of who God is as he wrestles. 
Look at verse six. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan, Hermon, and Mount Mizar. Do you see what the psalmist is doing? He says, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. And he remembers places, Jordan, Hermon, Mount Mizar. These are all places that are the last glimpse of the promised land in the north part of Israel on his way into exile. He remembers the place of the promised land. And he remembers that God is going to be faithful to him. Keep going. Verse 7. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. This reminds us exactly of what Jonah said in Jonah chapter 2. Of where Jonah said, I am driven away from your sight. All your waves and breakers have passed over me. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Verse 8. So what does he do? What does he do? He says the breakers and waves and waterfalls of God have have gone over me. God's judgment has come on him. He's far away from the land, but he remembers God. He remembers God. He says, by day the Lord commands what? His steadfast love, his covenant faithfulness. He remembers who God is and he says, verse 9, I say to God, my rock. He remembers what God has called himself. In the wilderness, in Exodus, God delivered his people and gave them water from the rock. And he chooses to remember here. He says, God, in my wilderness, where I am, I remember who you are. And I'm going to bring all of these questions that I have, not to somebody else, not wrestling just in me, but I'm going to bring those questions to you. He says, verse 9, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning? Where is your God? There's a lot that we can take with this, beloved. God wants you to be honest with him. He wants you to bring your deepest hurts and wrestlings and cares and anxieties to him. Peter tells us because he cares for us. Let's do what the psalmist does. Let's be honest with God in our wrestlings with him. God also wants us to remember that he's at work. Whether it be because other people have sinned against us, or maybe there's a combination with the suffering that we have maybe experienced because of past sinful choices, God is at work in those things. He's at work to prove your faith is genuine. He's at work to shape you into Christ's image. Not only does he want you to be honest with him, And remember, he's at work, but he wants you to call out to him. He wants to hear you. And he wants you to promise, or he wants you to call him to act according to who he is and what he's promised. There's so many examples of this in the Old Testament. You think of Moses and David and Joshua and Joseph. You think of Solomon. They all, when they pray to God, call out to him to act in what he's already said about himself. And that's what they appeal to God, not on how they felt. When you feel as the psalmist does, remind yourself of who God is and run to him. Let's look at the last five verses. Psalm 43. Psalm 43, the psalmist's plea. And what does he want? More than anything, he has a request for God's deliverance. What does he say in verse one? Look at it with me. He says, vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. Do you see the change in tone? We started off at the beginning of the psalm and there was this sense of weariness, of dryness, of thirst, of parchness and and saying, God, I thirst and I long for you. And then it moved into, into this wondering and bewilderment to say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how you're at work in this, but I remember who you are. And then it comes over into Psalm 43 and it says, vindicate me. This is confidence. 
Vindicate me is a more resilient opening than the rest of the verses. And what does the psalmist want? If you look at verse three, he says, send out your light and your truth. Send out your light and your truth. Why truth? Well, truth to prove that he's innocent and show that God is not absent. Why light? Light to bring him home. He is in the darkness of the desert. He's in a different country. He's being oppressed. And the psalmist uses this imagery of light to bring him back because the temple was a place that was filled with glory and light. The promised land was supposed to be the place where God dwelled. Light was there. And he's saying, God, bring me back home. Send out your light to bring me back. Think of when the wise men, the magi, came all the way from the east to see Christ. The star led them over the place where the child was. Think of the way that John talks about it, the way that Luke talks about it. Those dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And finally, in verse 4, look at what he says. And he says, Then I will go to the altar of God. And he's going to go back to the place of worship where he first was. Why the altar? Why would he say, let me go to the altar of God and I will praise you then on the lyre? Well, he wants to go to the altar for several reasons. The first reason is he wants to be cleansed. He wants to be purified. That any defilement that the exile of him being outside of the promised land would have brought, he wants to be cleansed and purified for worship. And then he wants to go to the altar because he wants there to be atonement. He wants to place his burnt offerings. He wants to place his guilt offerings on the altar at the temple so that he knows that if there was any sin that he committed, God offers forgiveness cleansing, atonement, forgiveness, right standing, and everything that the psalmist longed for, God has already done for every single one of us who've trusted in him as Lord and Savior. He's brought you back, not from a foreign land, but he's redeemed you from the domain of Satan. He's taken you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's cleansed you from your sins. He's atoned for them. Colossians 1.13 puts it like this. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Is that a reason to praise God today? If you've yet to trust in Christ, if you can say along with the psalmist, my soul is troubled, my soul is in turmoil, if you feel that you're still held captive by the evil one, you can be delivered today. You can be transferred from living life how you've wanted to live and you being in control and you can offer yourself just like this psalmist did. You can offer yourself and say, Lord, you are mine. I trust and believe in you, your death, your resurrection, and he can give you eternal life today. As we see the longings, the wrestlings, the pleas the psalmist makes, this all should lead us to the Lord Jesus. I want you to look on the screen for a moment at John 12. John 12, 27, Jesus is our true model of this psalm. And as we read this psalm, we can't help but think about Christ. And Jesus himself said in John 12, 27, now is my soul troubled, in turmoil. The very same word that the psalmist used to describe himself here. And then Jesus says again, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. He says, one of you will betray me. Jesus had the very same experience that we have and that the psalmist had in Psalm 42 and 43. But because he trusted in God, he trusted in God to deliver him. He trusted that God was going to raise him from the dead. He can now tell us in John 14, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts 
be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And as we think about the words of this psalm, when the psalmist says, my soul thirsts for God, we look at Jesus as the living water and he tells the woman at the well, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will what? Never be thirsty again. Later, when he stands up at the Feast of Tabernacles and Booths, which is possibly the exact same feast that this, or the exact same festival that the priest was longing to go back and lead again, Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The psalmist said, send out your light, send out your truth. And Jesus says in John 8, I am the what? The light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Send out your truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The psalmist spoke far better than he knew. When he asked God and said, I'm thirsty, bring me back, send out your light and your truth, he had no idea the beauty of what God was going to do just a few hundred years later. And the psalmist said, when shall I come and appear before God? When shall I come and appear before God? And Jesus says in John 1, the word became flesh. That's what John tells us. Christ became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus answered everything the sons of Korah longed for. And so while you and me wait for his return, there will be moments of where we live in this reality where we feel more like the psalmist in 42 and 43. We'll still experience the same emotions, the same circumstances that the psalmist felt. So, when the darkness doesn't lift, the psalmist gives us a model of faithfully longing for, wrestling with, and pleading with God as he talks to himself. The question that we must answer is the one that we are waiting for, worth the wait. When God feels distant, let's do as the psalmist did. Talk to him, wrestle with him, plead with him. And we know by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has promised to never leave us, never forsake us. Let's glory in Christ today. Would you pray with me? Father, when our souls are downcast and you feel distant, remind us of your truth. Remind us of who you are. May we come to you with, with hearts that are full of faith and honesty that we might find joy and life in your presence. Help us to walk with Jesus today. Let us long for him more. In this world, as strangers, as exiles ourselves, waiting for you to come and be with us forever. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.